Good evening, I'm Debbie Cooper, and there's my co-host, Anthony Germain, at the St. John's Convention Center tonight. Looking very dapper there, Anthony. Oh, I appreciate that. I'm celebrating your retirement a week early, if you don't mind. Uh, actually, the reason we're here at the St. John's Convention Center, as Debbie mentioned, uh, a big day in Newfoundland Labrador history, actually in world aviation history, celebrating a century since Alcock and Brown took off from that memorable field and landed in Ireland. Now, it's important to sort of take a look back, and who better to do that than our ace reporter, Chris O'Neill Yates. When I flew the Atlantic, my most difficult choice was uh, chicken or beef. The feat Englishman John Alcock and Arthur Brown accomplished 100 years ago is not lost on retired commercial pilot Dave Padden. What they did was amazing. They never saw the ocean, hardly at all. It started in this field owned by a local farmer and businessman. Newfoundland was the closest point to Europe, but it didn't yet have an airfield. One had to be made. What's the significance of this place where we're standing? This is approximately where Alcock and Brown began the takeoff run in their Vickers Bimmy biplane to make the nonstop flight across the Atlantic. For the Gary Hebert is an aviation history buff. And this street that we're looking at right now was essentially the runway, exactly. part of the runway for Alcock and Brown. Yeah, exactly. Some of the images, they look quite relaxed for uh, what they had ahead of them. This museum lucked into some extraordinary pictures of Alcock and Brown from a private collection. Candid shots taken by a St. John's woman who befriended them. That is Alcock and Brown having a picnic with the Vimy in the back. But getting airborne was no picnic. Locals were hired to clear the field so Alcock and Brown could take off in their Vimy Vickers. They removed boulders, they removed fences, they removed stone walls where necessary. Tried to make it as smooth as possible. The plane, assembled from wood, canvas and wire, encountered wind, rain, ice, everything the North Atlantic could throw at it. They were in cloud for about 16 hours and Alcock had to maintain control by reference to some very primitive instruments the whole time. An awful lot of people said, it's not going to work, you're going to die, you're going to be, uh, you're going to go missing in the ocean and you'll never be seen again. But they made it, landing in an Irish bog, just 10 miles from where they'd planned to land beating out three other crews, also competing for the 10,000-pound daily mail prize for the first plane to make it across the Atlantic without stopping. It secured Alcock and Brown's place in history. The fact that you can get on an airliner today and fly basically any, anywhere in the world is because these guys did it first. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News. It's such a story of guts and determination and bravery if you think about taking off back then. Now, yesterday we sent Ashley up in a helicopter. Today was Zach Gowdy's turn. They tried to recreate this flight as much as possible. Of course, they didn't have a biplane, but the spirit of Alcock and Brown, that was certainly present today. So, Zach, how did this thing get off the ground. Well, you think about what we're celebrating here today. This is an anniversary of a famous flight, and while all the balls and exhibitions are wonderful, to do justice to this day, you really need to get a plane in the air, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, Aviation History, Newfoundland and Labrador, who are putting off this event tonight, they work with provincial airlines on a commemorative flight that would retrace the flight path of Alcock and Brown. So, of course, it took off from the St. John's Airport, but then flew low over the city, low over what is now Black Marsh Road, but in 1919 was known as Lester's Field. There gained altitude out through the Narrows and on a course for Ireland. Right now, obviously, you didn't go to Ireland because CBC has some budgetary constraints and you wouldn't have made it to our deadline. Yeah, we had to get back in time for this <laughs> show tonight. But we still did manage to capture the spirit of Alcock and Brown. Even though you're in a modern airplane, uh, they had historical narratives, recitations. They had an actor in period costume. And when you looked out the window as you flew through the Narrows, you could really appreciate what these two people did. Here's what it felt like. This is going to be a reenactment, as near as we can make it in, in modern times, of the Alcock and Brown takeoff from St. John's 100 years ago today. We're going to take off from St. John's International Airport as opposed to Black Marsh Road, and we're going to fly the same route that Alcock and Brown flew as they gained altitude, stabilized their speed, they headed out down over the harbor, out through the Narrows, and on into history. Breaking news. Stop. The 1919 air race to cross the Atlantic has begun. 
The Globe watches the goings on in Newfoundland. Preparation for takeoff. Please ensure your seatbelts are securely fastened. If you have a negligence on your table tray and seatbelt or any upright unlocked position, thank you. Once off the ground, the plane disappeared from view as it flew through a valley, slowly but steadily gaining altitude and speed. A newspaper reporter described what happened next. Alcock pointed the plane's nose toward the harbor, and as they overflew it, the ships below sounded whistles and foghorns in a final salute. About 15 minutes later, at 1.57 local time, they crossed the coast and were truly Europe and history bound. Quite an honor, to be honest with you, to uh, be able to uh, do something so historic. Uh, as you can tell, uh, our sophistication is uh, much more advanced than what uh, Alcock and Brown uh, and their challenges that they had uh, uh, 100 years ago. And really, we look at those as pioneers in their field, and, and what they did is, is pave the way for transatlantic flight and, and make air travel uh, really what it is uh, today for everybody. I wanted to be a pilot ever, ever since I was little. I really thought that flying was really nice, and so I joined Air Cadets, and I want to be a pilot when I get older. And what does it mean for you to be here today on this historic flight? Um, I'm really happy. I didn't know anything about it. I was looking at it like about a week ago, and I was looking all about it, and it's really interesting, and I'm really proud and excited to be on this flight. And these sky pilots have reminded us what it means to be alive. But most importantly, they have shown us what it means to truly live. It's interesting, Zach, that uh, that tradition of clapping when you land. Is that uh, done anywhere else? Do people only do it when they land in Newfoundland and Labrador? I don't know. But it's funny that uh, on the day, on this day, 100 years ago, uh, in that narrative that Gary Hebert relayed, he said that people burst into applause when this plane got off the ground. And uh, I just think it's wonderful that was right. what was celebrated then is still being celebrated here tonight. All right. We'll celebrate with you. Cheers. Thank Anthony. you very much. My pleasure. That's Zach Gowdy. Now, stay tuned. We've got more coverage uh, coming up later on here and now with some very interesting guests. We'll look at the history and also meet Newfoundland's candidate as an astronaut at NASA and talk about how flight 100 years ago links to travel in space. That's